morning. And thanks for joining our worship service this morning. It's so nice to worship with you. Uh, we are working on the reopening of the church. We'll let you know when you make the decision. Uh, please join us for Zoom copy hour at 11 o'clock after the service. Please join me now in the call to worship. Out of depth, we cry to the Lord. We wait for the Lord and find hope in God's word. Hope in the Lord. For with God, there is steadfast love. With God, there is great power to redeem. So we come to offer our prayers and praise to God in whom we trust. Let us pray. A great and holy God, source of our life and all life, your glory is incomprehensible and your majesty infinite. You are the wellspring of new life and the fountain of true freedom. We marvel at your love beyond all measure. We are challenged by your kindness which reaches further than we can imagine. We worship you in gratitude, offering you our praise with the voices of all creation and our trust, because you have come too close to us in Christ Jesus. Receive our love and loyalty now and always, offered through the Spirit who prays with us. Great and merciful God, our judge and our hope. We confess we have sinned against you and one another in the ways we think, the things we say, and the things we do. We have been quick to judge others, but less critical of our own actions. We focus on what we lack rather than recognize how blessed we are. We ignore the needs of others and fail to see how we could make a difference. In your tender mercy, O God, forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct who we shall become. Through the grace of our Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. And we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. And Christ rose for us. 
Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's generous grace. Share this good news in the way you live with each other. Amen. Good morning, children. How are you today? The school's over yet? So when you have vacation, be safe and be happy. Okay? So how many of you have ever run in a race? If you were going to have to run in a long race, what things could we do to get ready? We could get in shape by practicing. We could eat healthy things before the race, so we'd have energy. We could wear lightweight clothes and good sturdy shoes. So listen to a couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. So all of us are in the race God has set before us. Our lives are like a race. So we try to do what God wants us to do as we walk through life. So if you are carrying around sin and anger and bad feelings, those things can slow us down, just like the kids slowed down our racer. So we can pray for God's help to keep us from sin and anger and bad feelings. And we can let God's forgiveness take away the weight of the sins we do commit. When we finish the race and come to the end of our lives, what happens? Jesus is waiting for us, isn't he? And the people who have gone on before us to heaven are there to cheer us on and encourage us to keep going. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, take away all sins and bad things that slow us down and keep us from running toward you. Amen. Good morning. Today's first scripture reading is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 85, verses 8 to 13. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him and that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Today's second scripture reading is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Today's third and last scripture reading is taken from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead? For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord.
Would you believe that the entire reading today, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14, in the original Greek of Paul, is one single sentence made up of 201 words? It is the longest sentence in the Bible. No punctuation at all. When you read a sentence in Greek, the first thing you have to do is find the subject and the verb in order to put the other words in order. The subject of the sentence is God, and then God is followed by seven incredibly active and descriptive verbs. Blessed, chose, destined, bestowed, ravished, made known, and gathered up. As God's own, according to Ephesians, we are the objects of all those wonderful verbs. These verbs show us what God is doing with us and in us and among us. The first verb is blessed. God is the source of all this. This is an essential beginning. The fatal error in spiritual formation is to begin with ourselves. We must begin with God. We begin with God and the blessings of God that set a tone for who we are. Imagine a blessing, splashing like goodness and glory of God, splashing on us and drenching us. Not just a little sprinkling, but drenching. Indeed, the Bible reveals that blessing has been God's work from the beginning. Abraham is blessed with land and family. Mary is identified by the angel as being blessed by God. Jesus blesses children. So often we think of blessings as, we, as something we have accumulated. The family, home, prosperity. But receiving a blessing is really a form of receiving God himself. God bless us with his presence. The spiritual blessings in the heavens aren't something we wait for later. They are available to us now. The second verb is chose. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. We have been chosen, not last, but first. We have been chosen before the foundations of the world to be His. We were made for this, made in His image, crafted for God's purpose. We've not been chosen because we were the fastest, the prettiest, the smartest. God chose us because He loves us. He wants us to set us apart as His own. Each one of us is of infinite worth because God chose us. This is who we are in Christ. God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, called us by name. We are the priority. And the writer reminds us God won't forget about us. God provides direction and purpose for each of our lives, as well as for our corporate witness in the local congregation and in the world. Next, God destined. The Greek word translated destined actually derives from the word that means to set a limit or mark a boundary. It also reminds us of a destination, the goal of a journey. A boundary tells us where we belong. It gives us a place to start. It reminds us that we did not invent reality. God, in calling us the church, tells us that we are not alone in the universe, subject to the whims of fate or bad luck. No, instead, we have a destiny. So this idea, a concept of predestination, gives us some things to consider. First, it takes us out of the driver's seat. 
we are not driving the salvation vehicle or the spiritual light vehicle. We are not in charge of the holiness vehicle business. Salvation and life is not a do-it-yourself or self-help project. It's first of all and primarily God's project. Second, it rescues us from small-mindedness. It keeps us from thinking too small about our life. This is large, eternal, magnificent. Predestination is something that we can't understand. It is designed to do that so that you can open yourself to the whole sweep of things we can't limit it to our perspective. It's what God destines that matters, not what we decide. We are involved in something glorious, magnificent, eternal, something great. And it's easy to miss that. We need a sense of largeness. Third, it comforts. Relax, we are not in charge. What's better than that? Sometimes we feel exhausted, harassed, fatigued, but it's okay. It takes people's gaze off of the daily stock market of your own spiritual lives and return it to God's purpose. Fourth, it frees you to the things that humans can do. Hugh's paradox in predestination is that it is freedom. We do the faith and belief business, not the salvation business. We are humans. Let's do what humans do. Let's do what we are good at doing. Not created to be a junior God, created to be us. Next, God bestows. What an interesting verb. Bestow is more formal than give. It's more generous than supply or dole out. In fact, Paul is so eager for us to see that God is a liberal giver that the next verb backs up bestows. God lavishes. What does God lavish? Grace. Theologians will tell you that grace is unmerited favor. Grace is something that we don't have to deserve. Grace is that we need to get through the day. And what we need to grow into the church that God calls us to be. And God bestows grace lavishly. He drenches us with it. God oozes from every interaction we have with God. Grace was before we woke up this morning, and we'll be here when you go to bed tonight. Next, God makes known. What a joy that is. Paul reminds the church that God will not keep us in the dark. God intends to show us those things that appear to be mysterious right now. God reveals. And the last verb we consider today, God gathers up. There are no loose ends in the kingdom. There is no waste. There is nothing that is left out or forgotten. The God who chooses and blesses and directs and pours out and reveals is the God who, at the end of the day and finally at the end of the world, will carefully sort and orient and bring together, gather up. What a gift. The energy we expend, the conversations we have, the deepest desire of our heart. They all have a place. There are no fragments. There are no broken edges. God's intention is wholeness and completeness in the church and in our lives. 
And that is how the letter to the Ephesians begins. When Paul starts to talk about what God intends for the church, he does so by listing a catalog of verbs that refer to what God does. We live in a world that lives by a different set of verbs. People believe they are cursed, they are unwanted, they have no purpose. They are starved for love. The goodness of life is hidden and they are scattered to and from by a host of conflicting messages and demands. Ephesians calls us to a fresh new imagination, an imagination stimulated and filled by God's grace and the possibility of new life even in the midst of death. We are invited to imagine the world and ourselves as we were meant to be. I want to tell you today that no matter who we are or what we are facing, no matter how far we've fallen or how broken we may be, we are blessed by a blessed God. We have been chosen first as the one God wants. We are destined for a life that is full of God's glory. We have been bestowed with marvelous grace. Indeed, God has lavished grace on us in Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven, our life renewed. We have been given the keys to the mystery and meaning of life, the gathering up of earth and heaven together, the restoration of the world as it was always meant to be. Our lives has a purpose within the purposes of God for the whole world. This is what Paul is inviting, inviting us to imagine at the outset of this powerful sermon. Can you imagine it in your own life? Can you imagine it for the world when we start living in the midst of those verbs, living for the praise of God's glory? Our lives will never be the same. Ephesians help us discover the new world and new humanity that God chooses to shape through His grace. We might not get everything explained to us, but we are in on it. We need redemption, forgiveness, and guess what? We get it. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Compassionate God, we offer you our gifts with grateful hearts, glad to know you keep reaching out to us and the world you love. Bless what we bring to you, and use us and our gifts to touch the world with your healing grace through Christ, our Savior and friend. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. I close our worship in benediction. Let us pray. Each of you has been given unique gifts from God. Use your particular gifts in the name of God and to do acts of charity. In the name of the God who created us, the Christ who frees us, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen.